you know, the smallmouth bass is the native trout in the Midwest. You know, if, if you follow what I'm saying there. Uh, and, and it's not, it just, we don't have the cold water to support extensive trout populations, but we've got thousands of miles of river smallmouth fishing, which is arguably as fun a game as trout fishing. That was Jerry Darkus clarifying which species is actually the native trout of the Midwest. This is episode 170 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Jerry Darkus, one of the biggest names in Great Lakes fly fishing, is here to share some tips on swinging flies for Great Lakes steelhead. We dig into some of the specifics on, uh, with a little bit on the St. Mary's River, the Grand, and other popular rivers and lakes in the Midwest. We also hear about some of the best resources for Great Lakes uh, steelheading and break down the switch rod gear you need to be successful and get started uh, today. I love when Jerry describes in this one the technique of swinging a fly off the ledge and into the slot. You can't miss that one. So without further ado, here's Jerry Darkus. Uh, how's it going, Jerry? Uh, going good, Dave. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on here. We're going to dig into a little bit on uh, just, I guess, the Great Lakes. Kind of focus on, you know, that's an area you've been you know, you're pretty, uh, your name is pop, pops up a lot with a lot of the people I, you know, I talk to and I get some feedback from, you know, people out in your neck of the woods. Um, but before we dig into that, can you just talk about how you first got into fly fishing and, and, and all the steelhead? Because I think, is that still your focus, steelhead fishing? Uh, you know, I do, I do a lot of steelhead fishing seasonally, but uh, there's a couple of buddies of mine in that. We start we're starting to do a lot more fly fishing out in the main lakes themselves, which is, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, a lot of salt water type situations uh, we run into there. But, you know, uh, from in the fall of the year and then, you know, through a, a big chunk of the spring, steelhead certainly the primary focus, you know. So, but I, you know, I've been at this game uh, a long time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid 60s and, you know, have fly fished since I was about 10 years old. And, uh, my original inspiration, uh, believe it or not, uh, going way back, was the old uh, American Sportsman TV show, which was on ABC many, many, many years ago. So uh, so that's kind of what got my interest going, and it, it took a while to really find anything uh, in Ohio at that time point. But, uh, you know, I did get hooked up with a few guys that opened up a little shop in my area, and as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. I, the American sportsman, I mean, after doing this show, you know, with, you know, I, I think we're over 160, 170 episodes now. I mean, it's come up quite a bit, you know, obviously, especially people, um, you know, from your, your generation. I mean, is there anybody, I mean, what, what else right now do you think is out there? That's like the American sportsman. Do, you, do is there anything equivalent or was it that just such a unique thing back in the day? Uh, you know, there's, I guess what made that unique is it was the only show, you know, uh, that covered all types of fishing, you know, bird hunting, duck hunting, big game hunting. It was all in one, you know, under one banner where now everything's, you know, super specialized uh, and, and you can go, you know, just about anywhere and, and find some sort of a, a, a TV show or something on YouTube focused on a really, you know, specific subject. So, I, you know, that, that the American Sportsman Show was definitely, uh, I think, unique in that aspect. There just really was nothing like it. And really, I, I can't think of anything that's really like it at this point either. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Everything is so, it's very niche down, right? I mean, there's a lot of... Uh ultra niches even even the magazines uh some of them are kind of in their own niche uh, so yeah that, that that makes sense i mean I, I think it's better for some you know today because if you want your if you want to focus on just uh you know whatever it is right you could find that little group probably out there yeah you know you know what's interesting too and uh i don't gee i'm already going off so oh yeah go for but, it 
<laughs> but, you know, even back uh, in when I was growing up, high school, college and all that kind of stuff, you know, we did things kind of seasonally also, you know, uh, where, you know, whatever was going on, whatever was the hot thing at that point is what we did. But now, you know, we've got guys that, you know, the only thing they do is strip streamers. You yeah. know, the only thing they do is, you know, uh, Euro nymph or something like that. Or, right. or like the only way they want to fish for steelhead is to swing flies, you know? So again, just that, I think the shows, the magazines reflect a lot of that where, you know, there's this just super specialization, uh, you know, throughout the sport. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just, it's just the way it's evolved at this point. Yeah. And I think part of that comes back to, uh, you know, like the business side, I'll bet you, you know, because in, you know, kind of in business, uh, you know, sure, I'm sure yeah. you know, the more niche you are to a certain degree, the kind of the better that is for your business, right? Because you become the leader in that space. I think of, uh, like you said, Euro nipping, we've had probably, oh, I don't know, six or 10 episodes just on Euro nipping and, and those people that, you know, have been on, have written books and they're the books on, right. They're, they're the people you think about. Um, and I'm sure you know them. So, and now when you started out, so, I mean, you're obviously, you're diverse, you've done it all, but when you started out, were you, were you kind of ultra, well, you said you you did a lot of things throughout the year, but when you're, when you started your business, take us to that point. I mean, how did you, how did you get to where you had, had a business in fly fishing? Uh, well, uh, geez, now I got to really think back (laughs) a little bit. Yeah. You know, when I, when I got out of school, I got a degree in like dual degree chemistry, biology. I, I worked in the environmental industry for, uh, I don't know, close to six, maybe close to 10 years. And, and, and that was okay. Uh, but that went through a bunch of consolidations, bigger companies buying smaller companies, et cetera. And, and I had a couple unpleasant transitions in that. And you know, I'd always kind of at that point begun to specialize more and more in fly fishing uh, as as I got, you know, in the college in that. And uh, uh, I actually originally got tied up or not involved. Let's let's put it that way. Doing some stuff with the St. Croix. Oh, yeah. Right. Company, uh, when they were really first starting to get a little more active in the fly fishing area. And uh, I ended up going to some of the early. Uh, fly tackle dealer shows helping them out and with that contact i i was offered a, a sales rep position with a group of companies you know here in the midwest uh and you know that's how i started in into the rep thing hmm. uh and then kind of uh at that same time period was when at least you know in my area, in the Lake Erie area, the uh, uh, steelhead or migratory rainbows, if we want to refer mm-hmm. to them as that, had really started to come on the scene. Uh, and I was, at least in Ohio, I was one of the first uh, guys to really focus on learning how to catch them on a fly. Uh, I had done a little bit of steelhead fishing up in Michigan prior to that. <laughs> Uh, but I kind of dove in head first and really deep into the into the Lake Erie stuff when that started off. So uh, nice. It was it it you know really at the early stages of uh, of that uh, in the Ohio tributaries for sure. Okay, and what is the I, to somebody who doesn't know the Great Lakes at all? Um... I mean, I want to dig into Lake Erie and, and some of your home waters, but can you give us like a, a, a kind of a quick primer, maybe not to go in a huge detail, but just on, you know, the lakes and maybe the few uh, big streams. So if we start at Lake Erie, you know, when you think of names, what are the big, what is the big stream or what is the place people are going for steelhead there? Well, you know, if, if we, if we start at Ohio, you know, these are going to be the southernmost of the Great Lakes tributaries. Uh, you know, we've got like our, our largest tributary on the south shore is is the grand river uh and but we've got a couple good urban tribute you know urban streams that Mm -hmm. are very productive uh you know rocky river chagrin river going out east you've got like conneaut creek which flows through both ohio and pennsylvania then you jump over into pennsylvania elk creek is really the primary stream there 
Uh, you get into York, you've got uh, Cattaraugus Creek, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which is a uh, probably the again on the south shore of the lake, uh, probably the largest drainage of of any of the Lake Erie tributaries, uh, and and a, and that's a great river to swing flies in. Uh, the probably the one negative, especially on the South Shore streams and, and Lake Erie streams in general, is that uh, they're all precipitation influenced, you know, spate streams. So mm. water levels are up and down, uh, and trying to pick the correct flow to swing flies or do something, you know, yeah. uh, you know, it, it makes it undependable to a certain extent, but adds to the challenge of it. To a certain extent, too. So you're constantly adjusting, depending on water levels and water clarities and things like that. Yeah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you got to keep yeah. up on it. And and what yeah. about and for the Lake Erie? What what is your main um, river there that you're you're fishing? Your kind of your home water. Uh, you know, my two favorites would be the Grand and Pontiac Creek. And, uh, between okay. those two, you can typically again again this is especially if you want to swing flies. Between those two, you can generally hop back and forth, and and uh, most of the time, especially in the main uh, fishing periods, you know, you you'll find conditions that are suitable to swing a fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you want to throw uh, nymphing, you know, indicators and stuff into the mix. Uh, the smaller rivers certainly come into play. Uh, you know, yeah. so it, it's all a matter of just. Watching stream flows and and, mm-hmm. and clarity and you know the the fly size and and color varies with all of that and uh, you know it's all part of the game. It what makes it really fun. Yeah. Well, where do you go uh, for stream flows? Do you have a specific site you look at? Uh, you know, there's been a couple of them on and off that have that uh, seem to have come and go. I don't I don't go to one one single site at this point. Yeah. I just go to the ES flows. Sure. Uh, and that, you know, makes it simple. Got them all loaded on my phone. So, you know, it just one push of the button and I'm ready to roll. I, yeah, I do the same. I do the same thing. Okay. And then, yep. so I want to dig into specifically some more, you know, maybe on one of those rivers. Um, but maybe you just talk again about, so you you cover steelhead. What other species uh, throughout the year are you are you fishing for? Uh, well, we, we do a lot of smallmouth bass fishing. Uh, and what's Kind of a unique phenomenon that you know very few people really know about is that a lot of the Great Lakes tributaries, not just uh, uh, the Lake Erie tribs, uh, get uh, migratory runs of smallmouth bass huh. in the spring. Uh, and you know, there these are a certain population of, of fish that come in and spawn uh, in the tributaries. Uh, I'm sure it's a protective evolution, you know. Uh, mechanism in case lake conditions are not good you know there is still at least the possibility of a, a successful spawn form uh, but pretty much all the tribs on the south shore get those migratory runs of smallmouth so we you know we get this kind of interesting overlap for about an, a month in the spring where I mean you can go out on a given day and and you know swing up a steelhead or two and you know, some big lake size smallmouth to go along with them. So uh, huh. it makes it kind of fun. Uh, but, you know, and we'll, we, we fish smallmouth out in the main lake. Uh, gosh, you know, freshwater drum are coming on the scene, uh, which are just a great fly rod fish. Uh, huh. they, they get a bad rap or have for a long time. It's kind of like the carp scene was, you know, a number of years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, but freshwater drum really hit flies aggressively, uh, and they get big. You know, you get a lot of fish up into that 8 to 10-pound range in certain places, even bigger in some areas. Uh, and you can find them in the shallows and sight fish to them, or you can fish over structure uh, with sinking lines and streamers. And, you know, they just add a really interesting mix of things. Uh, and depending where you're at, you know, across, you know, various places of the, the lakes and that, you know, you've got largemouth bass in the mix, uh, mm-hmm. northern pike and, and muskie are a big deal in certain places. So that's right. Uh, you know, the whole thing is has expanded out, uh, you know, as far as the species 
that you can chase. Uh, and, and there's a lot of walk and wade opportunities. Uh, there's a kayak, canoe, there's small boat. You know, so you've got a lot of different scenarios, uh, as well as, you know, pier and break walls at times, too. So, uh, again, this whole explosion in fly lines yeah. in, say, 20 years or so has just brought so much water within reach now that we didn't have previously. Uh, so, it, you know, it's been a good thing, uh, you know, because it's opened a huge area uh, for fly fishing that, you know, was not considered uh, conventional fly fishing water in the past. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. I love the fact that, you know, the, the line, and I know you maybe we'll talk about some of the companies you work with, uh, here eventually, but it's funny though, because I, I just interviewed Adrian Cortez, who's a steelhead fisherman out in the kind of Oregon. And, and he, um, he exclusively fishes dry lines in the winter for steelhead and, and a lot of dry fly stuff, but wet fly, you know, so he mm-hmm. takes, you know what I mean? So it's like the extreme version of, of some of the steel heading. So he actually uses, you know, bamboo and it's more of a throwback ties in hand and all sure. that stuff. So no, I was going to say, I know a few guys like that. Yeah. You know, and yeah. It, and it, <laughs> you know, what separates those guys that are like that from the guys that maybe are more of the, you know, want to use all the heavy uh, lines getting down or just kind of, is there much difference between, you know, what, I always wonder that, why would you want to put yourself where you're catching less fish? Uh, well, I guess it's kind of like making it as challenging as possible. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the, you know, evolving from, you know, you know, it, it's kind of the whole scenario when you first start out, you want to catch any fish. Uh, and then, you want to catch a lot of fish. And then, you know, as you progress, well, you, you're going to focus on big fish. And then I think that's kind of like the final stage in the whole uh, the whole process where, you know, I want to catch a fish by this particular method, you know, with this particular equipment. Uh, and if I don't, that's okay. But when I do, it's, you know, kind of like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, so. That's right. That's That's perfect. When you think about all these uh, fish species, you know, we, we, uh, you've written a couple books. I think you have this a new one coming out. I mean, what do you love to talk about most when, when you just think of on the on fly fishing? Is, is there a topic that you really just kind of get extra excited about? Yeah, you know, I I, I love the steelhead game, you know, and I, I did it here, you know, almost from the start. I certainly wasn't the first person to fish for him, but, uh, you know, been doing that, that game for close to 40 years. Uh, and, and, and we know there's a whole lot of people doing it now. Uh, and there's a lot of really good people doing it now. I mean, you, I think you've probably had a number of them, uh, yep. you know, on in the past out of this, this area here. Uh, so, uh, I think what really gets me going personally, you know, at this stage of the game is, is really, uh, opening up the door on, on the big lake stuff, uh, whether it be, you know, the tributaries are part of that, but you know, there's, there's so many river mouths, uh, that you can fish, uh, and, uh, you know, connecting waters, you know. We can look at uh, the Niagara River. We can look at uh, uh, the St. Mary's River uh, and some of those places like that, which are, you know, they're rivers, but they're huge, but they connect the lake. So they're almost like extensions of a lake. But if you take the Niagara River, for example, you know, uh, you can, I've caught a number of steelhead there swinging a two-hander from Mm -hmm. shore. You know, so you have that opportunity. You can swing a two-hander from a boat in the Niagara River, uh, you know, and you can do that while everybody around you that's fishing is bumping spawn bags or using quick fish or something like that. And and you can still catch fish. You know, mm-hmm. St. Mary's River, uh, you know, has got, from the Canadian side, you know, uh, a short area that, that you can uh, wade, and it's got pretty much all wild not native, but wild steelhead that return uh, throughout much of the year, uh, as well as additional species. Plus, you've got uh, an opportunity for Atlantic salmon there, too. Mm-hmm. You know, so that makes that one 
pretty cool. And you get those swinging flies. And uh, uh, and my buddy Jeff Liske has caught Atlantics up there on dries, you know. So, uh, and other guys have done that also, you know, using traditional Atlantic salmon type techniques and that. So yeah. it, there's just so much out there that is available that is... I'm going to say pretty much untouched from a fly sh- fly fishing standpoint. No kidding. Uh, so still to this yeah. day, I mean, like you said, you've been in it 40 years. It's still, there's places that fly fishing still isn't like the, the number one uh, thing that you see people doing out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, and this is, again, going off track again is, uh, you know, this whole the Lake Erie in particular is famous for its walleye fishing. Uh, you know, and, yep. and they're native species. They're supposed to be there, you know. So, uh, and in the fall, uh, there's a huge, there's a big migration of fish uh, following bait fishing as they move back in towards shore as the water cools off. And, uh, of course, it's a big deal to go out and throw gear for them. But, you know, there's a few guys that are, are trying to crack the code on catching those fish consistently on flies. Uh, you know, so that type of stuff is, I think, really cool. Uh, to, to try and go out and do that stuff and try and figure it out and and come up with uh, hopefully come up with a a, a fl- style of fly or presentation or something that will allow you to consistently catch those fish you know so there's just the lakes have a lot going on uh, you know that a lot of people don't really even know about uh, and so at this stage, I guess in in my life or career, however you want to put it, that's a lot of what my focus is. You know, steelhead will always be the first love and everything like that. But you know, trying to promote the lakes as more than just dragging lures around trolling or or catching steelhead in a tributary. There's way much more than that that's out there that again is is available and. Uh, if people do it, a lot of them are, it's like, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, yeah. uh, wow, I didn't know we could do this. You know, that type of stuff. So, That's it. Uh, you know, Lake St. Clair is another connecting water between Lake Huron and Lake Erie that has fabulous, uh, you know, fly fishing in it. Uh, average depth of the lake is 12 foot, you know, and yeah. it's an endless supply of gravel bars and rock piles and weed edges and, and stuff. Uh, and arguably the best musky lake, hmm. you know, there is right now. Uh, and smallmouth too. And is this all in, um, I mean, you, you have a couple of books there, I guess. Talk about your, um, is most of this covered in, in what, what was your first book? What's the title of that one? Uh, it was called Fly Fishing the Inland Oceans. Exactly. So so in that book, I haven't read it, but it, does that cover, I mean, we're having this conversation about all these amazing species and rivers. It, do you kind of cover it all in that book? Uh, I hit I hit a lot of it, yes. Uh, I mean, that was now the ground, a lot of that work was done about 10 years ago. The book's been out, I think, since 2013, something like that. So I know more now than I did then, but you know, a lot of the stuff is covered in that in that book, yes. And uh, at this point, there's a few more things I could add into the mix, maybe that weren't covered. Yeah. But you know, uh, in, a lot of the basics and well, yeah. it will be represented in there. Certainly, as far as the primary places to go and uh, types of flies to use, and and you know what fish where and when and that kind of stuff is definitely there. And then you also have a, a new book, right? Can you talk about your new book? I think more, it's, is it more on the fly tying? Well, it's, it's got a lot of history of fly fishing in the region on, uh, in it, as well as oh, very specific on, on fly tying, yes. Okay. Let, let's, yep. let's, take it, let's take it there because I'm always interested in a little history. I mean, I do want to dig into a specific river and talk about swinging flies and, and or steelhead or what, you know, whatever we can dig into, but... Can you take us back to the history? Because we take you, you said 40 years, so that brings us back to maybe the 80s when you started steelhead fishing. Can you connect us um, in the Great Lakes uh, to, you know, that history piece you're talking about? I mean, how far back are you going? And is it just the Great Lakes that you're talking about? Uh, well, yeah, in the, the this last book I had, uh, again, Essential, fly, essential Flies for the, uh, for the Great Lakes region, uh, I... You know, I actually go all the 
way back to the beginning stages of of of, of fly fishing in the area. You know, it, it originally the first references uh, are in the late 1700s and stuff. Uh, and you know, there was talk in early 1800s of you know various aspects of it. But you know, when things kind of really got going in the you know the 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 Northeast, the Poconos, uh, the Catskills in particular, Adirondacks, you know, we kind of look at that as yeah. the birthplace of fly fishing in the U.S. Well, the, the next place where, you know, the migration, so to speak, happened was was in the Great Lakes uh, area. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, at that point, looking at the early to mid-1800s, you know, all travel was by, by boat for the most part. Uh a really cool book that was published actually while the Civil War was going on. It's called uh, Superior Fishing by Robert Barnwell Roosevelt, who I think ended up was kind of like distantly, mm -hmm. distantly related to Theodore Roosevelt. But he wrote a book that Superior Fishing, among other things, documents a trip from like uh, like New York City and that up to the Nipigon River uh, in northwest Lake Superior, and this at that time that was a huge, huge adventure that took months. Uh, and they talk about stopping at the St. Mary's River at the the rapids, and then taking these, calling all their gear up past the rapids, and then taking a the steamer, and they would stop and fish all these river mouths uh, all the way across. Uh, you know, and they were after brook trout at that point, the the lake dwelling brook called coasters. Uh, and, and again, you can go follow the course where, uh, uh, you know, the first uh, book of the Black Bass by Henschel, which is the first really comprehensive uh, reference to uh, bass fishing and the, and the first real bass bugs. Uh, uh, that, those were, that was the late 1800s. But, uh, you know, a lot of the well-known uh, uh, fishermen out of the the Catskills and that they would go to Michigan to fish for the Michigan grayling uh, and when the railroads opened that's what really you know brought people out there uh, and unfortunately that also brought the logging industry yep. uh, and everything else which ultimately wiped out the Michigan grayling and oh, wow. uh, the native brook trout in a lot of areas and that they were supplemented or, you know, replaced by brown trout, you know, which were, were stocked uh, in the later 1800s. Uh, and Michigan was the first place that brown trout were stocked in the U.S. Uh, and also the first place that uh, uh, rain, and rainbows were stocked in the Midwest, too. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of firsts that come out of this area. And if we even go into the fly time history uh, you know, looking into the 30s and 40s, uh, the first parachute flies were tied out of this area. Uh, you know, the, the use of deer hair as a body material uh, laid parallel to the hook shank uh, was first out of this area. So, you know, so uh, this whole region has been, you know, important in the development of not only fly fishing, but fly tying in particular. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if we look at you know, the first really work on using streamers to, to target the biggest fish in the system. And that's Kelly Gallup and Bob Linsenman, uh, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago, something like that. So, you know, we've got this ongoing, uh, you know, continuous thing going. Uh, Gary Borgers from Wisconsin, uh, yeah. Swisher Richards with Selective Trout. I mean, uh, Ernie Schwiebert and Nymphs, and, you know, so... The list goes on and on and on that this particular region was very important in the development of fly fishing as we know it today. Uh, you know, the Adams dry fly, the yep. muddler, uh, you know, the first terrestrial patterns, the Griffiths gnat, you know, a lot of the modern mainstays uh, were developed in this area. You know, so uh, that book kind of, you know, focuses briefly on that history. But then what I tried to do was, was uh, there's a, uh, the various fly categories uh, have been 
presented with, you know, some of the classic designs all the way through to the latest, you know, cutting edge type stuff that's out there now. Uh, you know, Game Changer, you know, which is not developed here, but certainly has, you know, use in this area. Uh, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, with steelhead patterns, too. Uh, the nymp nymphing methods for steelhead, you know, probably really uh, became a, you know, an art form in this region. You know, uh, whether you agree with it or not, you know, egg yeah. flies, nymph flies. And used in tandem, I mean, that that's a major, major uh, style of fly fishing here. And But then now there's this uh, growing group of steelheaders that are kind of going back to the traditional methods. Uh, and, you know, traditional style flies, or at least swinging streamer type patterns of local designs as well as, you know, bringing in intruder style patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you look at somebody like, you know, you've talked to Kevin Feenster, you've talked yeah. to, I think, Pete Humphrey. Yeah. So, you know, those guys, uh, uh, you know, philosophies and that. And then you've got a younger a younger man, you know, like uh, Greg Senyo, uh, who has kind of gotten his own twist on these intruder style patterns and, you know, almost created a little niche or genre all his own in the way he does stuff so yeah. uh you know it, it's cool uh but you know so a lot of stuff was developed here you know a lot of stuff has been adapted for the region here uh but you know everything the the book is kind of covers all of that and i do everything from you know small trout flies midges and that are covered up to the up to the mega uh, predator patterns, you know, for muskie and, and pike and that too, and everything in between is, is covered in there. So I, I've tried to get a good representative selection of uh, those type of flies that, you know, cover the historical aspect of it, developmental stages, and, and what's, you know, what's current up to the latest point right now. No, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I love, uh, I mean, a lot of the names you miss. I just had Kelly uh, Gallup on recently and, um, you know, Gary Borger had him. I mean, that's a great thing. I always love having these conversations because I wonder, you know, how how well I'm doing and, you know, covering things because, you know, obviously I'm in Oregon, but I'm trying to cover the whole country. You know, I get a lot of people from the Great Lakes that email me and say, hey, you know, can you get this person, you know, or this topic? Sure. So it's a, it's a hot spot for fly fishing for sure. And I always want to know that I'm doing well. And Greg Senio, I have coming on here in a couple of months, I think. And um, cool. you know what I mean? It's like, but it's hard to get to everybody. I mean, Swisher and Richards, obviously that's, I think Kelly noted that book. Th those two guys, is that, that's, those guys have passed now. Is that, uh, Doug, uh, Carl Richards, uh, has passed away. Uh, I think Doug Swisher is still alive. Okay. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but you know, then, you know, as far as some of the stuff that's happened on, you know, other sidelines, as far as, you know, really bringing smallmouth, you know, it, it Mm -hmm. into the whole mainstream uh you know and that's a huge growth area in this region uh mm -hmm. because there's so much water you know from lakes the big great lakes to even small little tiny spring creeks that you know have smallmouth in them but are just not quite cold enough to hold trout and stuff do you, do you think there's more people now uh smallmouth fishing out there than, than there are trout fishing or is it kind of equal well, it depends, you know, it depends where you're at. What we what we do see is, you know, take place at, like Indiana, for example, or parts of Ohio where there would not be, there'd be virtually no fly fishing or no river fly fishing if smallmouth weren't the equation. No. Nope. Uh, and parts of southern Michigan, look at like, you know, I don't know, Mike Schultz in southern Michigan with his crew of guys, Tim Landwehr in Wisconsin, you know, you've got Chad Miller in Indiana. And other guys, you know, so they they've really brought the smallmouth uh, game I into the forefront, and uh, they're taking advantage of a resource that's that's right in their backyards. Uh, and you know, you, you can argue what's the better fish, but you know, the smallmouth bass is the native trout in the Midwest. You know, if, if you follow what I'm saying there, uh, and, and it's not, it's just, we don't have the cold water to support extensive trout populations, but 
We've got thousands of miles of river smallmouth fishing, which is arguably as fun a game as trout fishing. And, you know, uh, we talk about, we mentioned earlier before we even started about, you know, switch rods and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, swinging a switch rod for smallmouth and maybe a gurgler on the end of it or a, a little muddler or something like that or other fly, that's about as much fun as it gets. I mean, I'm telling you, just yeah. if you're going looking to have a good time, you know, so uh, it's adapting to what you have available, you know, and, and that's, I think, what, you know, what we're seeing is a big move in that direction. Yeah, that's cool. Well, let's take it back. I mean, if we had to go to one river, you know, I always like to try to do this where I can just to focus the conversation. I mean, I, I guess the St. Mary's kind of comes back to me, and I, I think – uh, I think I heard you uh, talk about this before, but, um, you know, the St. Mary's has Atlantic salmon, like you said, uh, and it's also kind of a river where it's, you know, the, the normal person can go there, right? You don't need thousands of dollars to go fish for Atlantic salmon. Is that something, you know, we might be able to dig into maybe a little bit on the St. Mary's? Uh, yeah, well, so there's there's two different things going on on the St. Mary's. There, there's a couple power plants on the U.S. side, which really are only fishable by boat. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, there's a couple guides, uh, that, that work that area, uh, you know, during kind of the prime, prime seasons for that. Just a couple? Uh, yeah. There, you know, there's really not many guys, at least on the U S side. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, the only guy I know that's, that's guiding fly fishermen regularly there is, uh, 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 Brad Petsky out of uh, Marquette, Michigan, or he's in the Marquette area. Mm-hmm. Rivers North, I think .net is his website. Very okay. cool guy, and he's few fish fly fishing guides. Period uh, on the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Uh, uh, so the U.S. side is mainly a boat game. Okay. You know, you can, and obviously, anybody can take their boat in there, you know, and and mess and you know try and figure it out. Uh, the Canadian side, you know, there is good waiting access. The issue right now is having the border closed. Mm. Okay. So right now, you know, from yeah. the U.S., we have to win to Canada uh, or anything like that. Uh, so that cuts out a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of great, great lakes water. That's right. Uh, but it does shut off the waiting section of the St. Mary's. Oh. Uh, Okay, so that's kind of that's in limbo right now till till we can get across the border again. Yeah, uh, but there is a there is a good stretch of the of the rapids there. I don't know, it's three quarters of a mile, mile long. That you know uh, you can easily park, and it's a short walk too. And uh, you know, there's fish there 365 days a year. Yeah, some sort of a migratory salmonid of some sort. Hmm. Uh, you know, we've caught steelhead there in July. Uh, the Atlantics are in there all summer. Uh, and again, you get the, the seasonal migrations of the Pacific salmon. Oh, right. In, you know, and uh, that was one of the first places where, you know, catching rainbows was first really featured uh, back in the 20s, 1920s, when Hemingway was still a young writer. He had an article that he put in the... Uh, uh, Toronto paper about, you know, the best rainbow trout fishing anywhere was in, uh, the rapids of the St. Mary's river, hmm. you know? So, uh, and that's from the original stockings. It's all still wild fish and everything. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, so that's certainly one, one area that, you know, is kind of unique in its own way. Uh, but you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, if we, again, kind of go back to the switch rod thing. Yeah. Uh, gosh, there's so many, there's so many cool little rivers. That's right. Maybe we could talk about that. Maybe we just keep it a little more general and say, let's say somebody, you know, kind of, well, I know there are a lot of rivers, obviously, out there. That's the, maybe the difference is that there's a lot more of the smaller rivers where you could, a switch rod might be better for steelhead as compared to maybe out west where you have a lot of big rivers. But if we stick on the switch rod, just generally, can you talk about a little bit about what it takes to catch steelhead out there with a the switch rod? Can we focus on swinging as well? Sure. Well, you know, again, the, the, the thing about switch rods is, 
you know, you, you can adapt the, the style of fishing to the conditions or, or how, I, you know, you want to do it. You can easily indicator fish with them uh, or, you know, you can swing flies with them. Uh, so that's what kind of makes them unique. You know, they're kind of a compromise between maybe the two ideal setups for either style of fishing, but, you know, they work well right. for, you know, both things. So that's kind of where they're in niching themselves. So there is a lot of, I suppose, what I would call more medium-sized streams, say Lake Erie, like a Conneaut Creek, uh, something like that. Uh, New York, you know, even Salmon River, yeah. you know, you can fish two-handers on the salmon, but you can certainly, you know, get by very well with a switch rod if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Michigan on the Lake Michigan side. Gosh, look at the, uh, you know, the Paramarquette. Yeah. The beautiful river. Uh, all wild, you know, all wild fish. That's a great switch rod river, as is on on the east side, maybe like the Rifle River uh, would be one I could think of. Uh, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, maybe the Brule. Uh, you know, that's a Lake Superior stream. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, a couple of rivers for each of the lakes right there. What, what is the, you know, if you're going to, uh, go with the switch rod, what, what's like the, the length, weight, kind of some of that stuff that you would recommend? Yeah. Okay. You know, I think if you're going to pick one, uh, I'd probably go with somewhere like a 10 and a half or 11 foot probably eight weight where you're throwing something in the 400, 450 grain range, uh -huh. you know, as far as line. Uh, and so you have the ability to, you know, at least put some longer, heavier tips on yeah. if you need to. I, I know here, you know, on our tributaries, when the flows are good, we're usually fishing maybe 10 to 12 foot of uh, the equivalent of a, uh, uh, like T10 or T12. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Whereas, you know, in the, something like the Paramarquette, you know, for some of their deeper pools or something, you know, uh, fast flow, good flow in that river, uh, and some deep, deep yep. holes in that might, you know, go up and, and throw some T14 on, or even maybe a little shorter length of T18 if you can turn it over. Uh, you know, and, uh, so again, we, often have to do a lot of adjustment with uh, with tips to kind of find the right feel on a given day. The multi-density tips certainly have their place. So, yeah, and then a rod. So, well, maybe we can just dig in just quickly on because I know you, you uh, rep a few companies. As far as if you're talking switch rods in this setup, you know, uh, what what rod, you know, kind of are you using, what, what brand, and, then think, talk, and also with lines? Yeah, you know, so I, I work a lot with Scott Rods. Uh, you know, their, their T3, uh, the T3H 11 foot eight is, is really a great all around rod, uh, you know, to use anywhere throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, it's just a very comfortable rod to fish, you know, handles fish well, uh, you know, you don't pull or pull a lot of hooks or anything with it on big fish. And then, you know, they're, they're, uh, their mid-price uh, rods also, you know, mm -hmm. do a nice job. We use the uh, 11 and a half foot eight on that one quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, so that they make, they make good rods. It's okay. a good company. Yeah. yeah. Scott's, it, Scott's you know. a good company for sure. And then what about for a line? Yeah. Lines, uh, you know, uh, we started again, this is just, you know, for my personal, what I yeah. have been involved with, uh, uh, the spay lights from scientific anglers have become super, super popular, uh, you know, not only for tips, but even the, the Scandi versions of the line, uh, you know, for indicator fishing and that, uh, if you want to go that route. Uh, but if you're looking for a line to kind of do the whole package, you know, and not have all kinds of, uh, spools and things you have to carry with you the the sa and adro line is actually uh a very good line to use too because you can put fairly fairly heavy tips on it if you have to uh and it turns stuff over really really well 
Uh, it does have an extended belly and back for mending, for mm. again, for indicator fishing and stuff. Uh, so it may not shoot quite as well as, say, a Skagit style with a tip on it. But again, we're, if you're looking to, for something to cover as many bases as possible, you know, without having a lot of extra things to carry with you, it'd be certainly something, uh, uh, something to consider. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And so that gets us in the ballpark for gear. And then, um, you know, if we take it to the, to the river, you were talking about a medium sized river. Can you just take us to that river, whichever one you're kind of is coming to your mind and maybe talk about if, uh, how to get started? I mean, is it different than if we're talking swinging, I mean, what, what are you putting on there? What, what's, you know, what type of water, how are you reading the water, that sort of thing? Okay. Uh, well, you know, from a swinging standpoint, uh, a lot of, I think, you know, the color choices here uh, are made based on uh, water conditions. Uh, and, you know, spring and fall will be considerably different in a lot of areas. If I look at Conneaut Creek, for example, you know, though the water will be fairly tannic still this time of year from all the leaves coming down. Uh, and, and again, I don't really get too excited about swinging flies until the until the leaves are off. Okay. Uh, you know, because we got tons of hardwoods here. Yep. Uh, you know, oaks and maples and everything. And, and when the leaves are coming off of them and you get a wind and, uh, you know, everything's blowing into the river, it's kind of like... It Crazy. can be, you know, yeah, it's just not fun. No. Uh, but once you get once you get the the leaves off, uh, and you know you get a nice nice flow, uh, and you can start using flies again. When water's fairly tannic, it seems stuff in the olives uh, with you know uh, copper, maybe a mix of car- copper and chartreuse. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, the greens and golds and, and copper mixes seem to work well in the tannic colored waters, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, uh, all black is, you know, some days, you know, just a hard one to beat. You can b- blend ba- uh, black with, uh, you know, a brighter color, uh, mm-hmm. purple and chartreuse can be a good one too, uh, uh, at times, you know, cause that's visible you know, under a wide range of, of uh, color conditions. Uh, so, you know, that's always a good back pocket color to have. Uh, and that's, I often fish that right off the bat, purple in chartreuse mixes. So, uh, you know, that's a good one to hang on to. But once things, you know, through the winter and when the water starts, we call it the water starts to green up a little bit. So we have this at least on these state streams here. Uh, and again, we have a lot of these in the Great Lakes, but this is particularly prevalent, you know, on the Lake Erie and probably the South Shore, Lake Ontario, uh, again, where similar streams are present. And you've got a lot of hardwoods in that. <clears throat> After you get a couple of good flushes of rain, uh, you know, a lot of that tannic uh, color washes out and in the water does what we call it it greens up whereas the deeper pools and stuff will start to get this really nice emerald green color to them <clears throat> and you know there the you know fly colors can change a little bit under those conditions we'll start to fish or start you know we'll start to use a lot more bait fishy looking patterns often you know the olives and stuff you know that'll still work black is always a good choice uh you know, but uh, brighter colored stuff, whites, uh, combinations of white and blue, white and chartreuse, you know, that, that will come into the mix more uh, under those conditions. Uh, and when we're talking about good clarity in our streams, you know, again, on this South Shore Lake Erie, we're looking at anywhere from probably 18 to 30, 20 to 36 inches of visibility. You know, uh, in the smaller rivers, those fish will be very, very comfortable in those conditions. But, you know, they can certainly see a fly extremely well. Uh, and a lot of the spots we're fishing are not, you know, they're not super long runs. You know, we just don't have uh, that type of stuff. And, 
you know, in the area where I'm at, uh, whereas a, a, a good pool or a good run might be a hundred feet long, mm-hmm. you know, something like that, you know, instead of a hundred yards long. So, uh, you know, there's often a lot more moving throughout the course of the day from spot to spot. Uh, once you fish through an area, you know, if you're convinced there's fish there, you know, you should go through maybe with a different fly color, uh, something like that. You know, that's kind of a, you know, certainly a traditional way to, to do that type of, uh, fishing. Uh, but you know, if, if you've, you know, hit an area and you feel like, okay, there's just, there's not one there, you know, there's not one that's going to play, then it's, it's time to move on. Uh, the other thing is historically, there's not been a lot of floating done on these rivers until recently. It was almost all walk and wait stuff. Now, some of the newer rafts that are on the market now, uh, you know, the fly crafts, the oh, yeah. fly, uh, you know, the similar stuff like that. <clears throat> We're starting to see a lot of rafts and, in that, and, and, you know, more guides and more guides in rafts and mm-hmm. things like that. So, uh, but you know, the ability to move is certainly works in your advantage, uh, on the waters here. Uh, you know, a lot of what we have here is, is shale ledges, uh, and the fish will, lay really tight to those ledges at times so getting the fly to drop off that ledge very quickly is often a key to success Mm -hmm. and here you know a combination of a tip with a fly with some weight you know can certainly help you out uh the problem is if you you know get too fast of a drop off the ledge and you start to swing and then you know you're hung up on the bottom so Uh, getting everything balanced correctly uh, can be a challenge, especially under, you know, colder water temperatures when the fish are just not that willing to move to take a fly. Mm. So, uh, you know, challenging, or, you know, it's it's a challenging game here uh, to swing flies and catch fish, you know, consistently. Uh, you know, there's periods of time where the, the smaller rivers, you know, will ice up, they'll cover right over. So uh, wow. at that point, you know, you're out of the game or, you know, you look for bigger water somewhere to go to. Right. Uh, Because there are places that, you know, rarely do freeze, but, you know, uh, you're going to be fishing water that's 34 degrees, you know, that type of stuff. So, uh, you know, the swing game is definitely challenging. Uh, But, again, that's kind of what makes it fun. Yeah, that's what makes (laughs) it fun. What percentage, if you think roughly just guesstimating, you know, percentage of people are swinging versus kind of using nymphs and fly fishing? Uh, You know, I'd say we're probably, you know, there's a lot of guys that will go back and forth depending on conditions. Yeah. Uh, But as far as hardcore swing guys, and that's the only way they want to do it, out of the fly fishing crowd at this point, I don't know, I'm going to guess... 25%, 25%, oh, yeah. 30% so good, maybe, maybe up to a third of them. So, yeah. you know, it's a fair number of people. Uh, you know, I think, uh, and again, that varies depending where you're at around the lakes to a certain extent too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a reasonable percentage of, of people that want to, you know, fish that way. Okay. And what was your, and without giving away any secrets, is there a, a river uh, in your, I don't know if it's a, there's a Lake Erie River you mentioned at the start that would be good with the switch rod? Um, I guess you, you're looking at oh, size, well, or are you just looking at size, you're kind of thinking size mainly like with the river? Yeah, just mainly the size of the river and that, you know, again, I think I, you know, mentioned the Paramarquette being a great one in Michigan, uh, you know, here in Ohio, uh, you know, the, the Grand River is a good one. Uh, Conneaut Creek is another good one oh, yeah. for that style of fishing. Yeah, Conneaut. You know, the Grand, yeah, the Grand in Ohio, you can fish a full two-hander at times, but again, uh, that's a river where when the flows are right, often it's got a high sediment load to it. So yeah. again, just finding that open window uh, is always the uh, always the challenge. Yeah, uh, yeah. Say, that would be the same thing for Cataraugus Creek in New York also. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that that river drains uh, a lot of the uh, ski areas uh, oh, right. in the, the highlands there in western New York. Plus, it's right in the middle of the snow belt. Uh, 
you know, where the lake effect snows are, you know, often the heaviest that they get. So uh, any little melt, uh, you know, can just throw the whole thing out of whack. So uh, you can plan a trip, you know, for next year on November 10th or whatever the date is right now. And you just don't have either enough water to fish it or you might have too much water to fish it, you know. So you have to be very adaptable and, you know, willing to adjust uh, in order to stay in the fish, you know, consistently. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, going back, I just think about the rod. So if you mentioned an eight weight, is is a six weight, um, 11 and a half foot six, is that a little too light or is that, does that work for some areas? You know, it's fine if you can turn over the tips that you need. Oh, that's that's the big thing. The tips, because sometimes, like you said, well, like you said, the the, the Cognac Creek is is that one where you might need uh, some real heavy stuff to get down pretty quick. No, Cognac, you can often use lighter stuff, uh, and there, you know, uh, you know, the six weight is fine. Okay, and can yeah, you spell that? The time, can you spell the name of that one? Uh, C O N N E A U T. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Yep. You know, so again, it's I would, I would err on the heavier side if I was going to pick, you know, one rod to use rather than, yeah, you know, having something that's too light where it, it can't turn over the flies or turn over that's the chips right. that are needed. You so know, eight so weight, a weight is kind of more, or would a seven seven weight be an all around, or is the eighth more of your all around for just Great Lakes? Yeah. Well, seven or eight, but if I look at again some of the some of the uh, larger rivers, like uh, should I say rivers with more flow, uh, again like a Paramarquette or something like that, there you might find that the eight's going to be a more usable tool, uh, you know, just because of the need for probably heavier tips and things like that, you okay. know, so. Uh, yeah, but you know, seven or eight probably suitable in just about any situation. Gotcha. Okay, and I'm just trying to yep. just trying to paint the picture. You know, uh, trying to for me trying to and anybody listening to help understand what we're we're talking about here. I mean, I've had a a ton yep. of steelhead episodes, and you know, we've talked a lot about this. But I think it's interesting because we haven't talked about the switch rods that much. It seems like a lot of people are, are using at least out west using kind of the big the bigger stuff Mm -hmm. and even some of the really big stuff, right? Guys are going old school, traditional. Um, So it's cool. I mean, I think the switch rod and also the switch rods, it seems like they almost get a, it's almost like that name is going away as well. You know, it seems like, um, do you still hear, are people still calling I mean, is switch rod still a thing out there or is there a different name? for? Yeah, they call them switch rods. You know, when it comes to that type of stuff, we tend to lag about, I'm going to say two years behind on what's, you know, going on on the west coast and yeah. that it's just it just i mean it's the way it's always been yeah you know <laughs> it's still so. it's still the same so so wherever we're at right now you guys will will be cut well i mean some of it uh i guess the grand do guys are guys using um big 15 foot rods out there at all the big stuff back in the old yeah old not so much 15s not for practical fishing rods but yeah. you know a lot of 13 to 14 foot stuff yeah yeah, yeah so they're using yep, when flows are up that's right yep Sure. Okay. Okay, Jerry. Uh, well, I think uh, we're going to get out of here pretty quick, but before we do, maybe we can just take it out with the 222, which is the, the top two tips, top two flies, and top two resources. And, you know, we've covered, I, I love this because we've been covering it. We've covered a lot of the Great Lakes. Obviously, you know more about it, but we in one short uh, hour-long episode, we can't, you know, cover it all. So um, focusing it again, back down to Steelhead, if we take it to that little medium-sized creek, we got a, um, you know, a switch rod, we're trying to find a steelhead. Maybe, maybe we've never hooked a steelhead on the swing out there, but, um, would you have a couple of, let's just start with the flies. What would be two flies? You said the green, are there a specific names of flies you might put on there first? I would say what we need is we need a, a dirty water fly and a clear water fly. Okay. Okay. You know, and a dirty water fly is going to be big uh you know uh jeff liske has uh who's a very well-known guy out of this area and that's probably somebody you should yep. get on at some point too uh you know he does just a kind of generic uh maybe arctic fox with a lot of you know different flash in it but he'll put for example he'll do like a black with a a flame orange uh, laser the head on it, 
you know, uh, in, in like a veil. And then uh, a clear water version might be, uh, uh, you know, an olive one with okay. a little bit of chartreuse at the head or something like that. Because, you know, most of our fish, if they're feeding, are feeding on bait fish. Uh, yeah, we don't have a huge, at least, again, I'm talking about the South Shore, Lake Erie streams. We don't have, you know, we've got some, we've got black stones, we've got golden stones, we've got some caddis, but the, they're, they're full of emerald shiners and different shiner species and creek chubs and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, uh, if there is a, a natural food base in there, a lot of it is going to be, uh, you know, bait fish based. So, uh, but I would say you need a, a dirty water fly, you need a, a clearer water fly. And you can talk to 10 different guys and you're going to get 10 different yeah. opinions on what's best. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, if I had to pick one fly to use under all conditions, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, I would I would fish like probably a purple uh, with like a chartreuse head. And that chartreuse head, and it can be a, a rabbit strip wing. Uh it can be, you know, Arctic Fox mm-hmm. or something similar like that, uh, but with a laser dub or ice dub head on it and varying amount of flash depending on, you know, actual water clarities and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I fish a lot of tubes uh, personally, mm-hmm. and uh, I know Jeff uh, fishes a lot of tubes too, you know, just for the ability of being able to adjust the hook uh, location and things like that. So, uh but I, you know, if I had to pick one color, that might certainly be one I would consider. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, here the standard tip length. If we have good, good flow to swing flies, you know, we're looking at generally about say ten to twelve foot of a T ten or T twelve. That's it. Okay. Perfect. No, I give. Okay. Us- you know, yeah. again, this is narrowing it down as as lean as you could possibly get it. Uh, you know, and we're often, you know, running straight 15 pound right off the uh, tip. You know, off generally, you know, three to four feet, 15 pound off the tip. In real cold water, you might shorten that up to a foot to keep the fly as close to the bottom as you can. If there is a little more clarity to the water, uh, you know, and it's a little warmer, you could lengthen that out to maybe five, six foot at times. Yeah. Perfect. And, and what about a couple of tips? If again, if we're on the water there, we're trying to find a steelhead. What would you have a couple of tips uh, that might help somebody if they had this set up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, again, if you can, if you've got enough visibility to see where the uh, where the ledges are, uh, and look for, well, let's put it this way: uh, warmer temperatures, especially in the fall, this time of year, the fish are going to be either right up at the head of the pool, even sometimes right in the, you know, the fast white water. Uh, and they'll be in the, maybe uh, all the way down to the bucket. So they'll be in the front half, front third of the pool. Uh, coldest conditions in the winter, uh, they're going to be, all the fish are going to be in the, in the deepest part of the pool in the mm. bucket. Okay. Once we get towards spring and we've got spawning activity going on, the, the majority of our fish are, winter run spring spawners uh you're looking at the fish are going to be in a lot of cases they'll be you know starting to go into the back part of the pool you know where the tail outs yep. uh, where there's gravel and stuff more so at that point you might be looking at you know the bucket back to the tail out then so you can kind of you know you've got those three parts of the pool uh you know if you want to again just do a very generic sure. Uh, breakdown but very rarely where will you find fish in all three spots yeah on a given day gotcha okay they're going to be in they're going to be in two of the three typically and sometimes only one of the three yeah okay? so that you know basically breaking down a pool based on season and water temperature i think is an important thing to learn that's great that's a great tip so so if again we're, we're there we're fishing it's kind of this time of year which is november ish or whatever the before it gets too cold um you might be hitting the the upper part of that run and then would there be another mm-hmm. another tip you throw out there to, to help somebody as they're swinging i mean is it just pretty much cast down and across and 
throw a mend in it to get it down? Anything else you'd mention? Yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> don't be afraid to to really step down uh, and to you know to, to allow a fly to drop in tight along a ledge mm. or yeah. or in structure uh, or you know you know we always have this whole thing where you can you're told always hold the, the tip of the rod down and yeah. and uh, you know into the water. Well, it might be that for the first part of the swing while everything's settling. You know, you can actually hold the rod up fairly high, but when you get into that spot, especially coming off, trying to drop off a ledge or that type of thing, just instead of maybe doing a step back, drop the rod tip at that point. Oh, yeah. So, so that fly will drop, you know, it'll kind of wave a little bit, and then it'll get that, you know, once yep. it tightens up again, it's going to take off. And huh. that'll often, you know, that that's often the trigger right there that's cool to get a hit uh especially in smaller you know in, in in smaller spots like that that's a really uh i think a really good trick to have in your bag uh the other thing is to again let make sure you let the fly swing in tight and before you pick it up to recast give it a couple strips oh, okay yep so a lot of times they'll yep. follow it in and you know you're going to get uh especially you know, with these bait fish patterns and that, you'll get, you know, you'll you'll get a certain amount of fish that hit, you know, on a strip on the way in. That's right. And this would be more down, is this at the hang down or before the hang down? Yeah. 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 Kind of on the hang down. Yeah. On, on the hang down. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Those are, those are killer tips. So, and then what about resources? We talked about your books uh, there at the beginning. You've got a couple of uh, probably some of the best resources, but any other thing, you know, books, magazines, um, websites, anything that comes to mind that would be a good resource if somebody wants to, you know, learn more about switch or spay or uh, steelhead fishing there? Uh, oh gosh, there is, <laughs> where do you start? Is there a lot? Uh, oh yeah. There's tons of stuff out there. I mean, if you start looking up, you know, Great Lakes steelhead fishing and that, you're going to be, there's going to be tons of stuff out there. Now, uh, Rick Custich has a couple books out. Oh, yeah. That, you know, that, that deal specifically on steelhead. Uh, yep. I think he's got three books out now, and I think the last one was pretty much all swung fly stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, so certainly Rick's stuff is a great, okay. uh, great resource. Uh, there's another book out there, John Nagy's Lake Erie Steelhead oh, Guide, yeah. which is, yeah, you know, which is just you know location type of information, not specifically the swung flies or anything like that. Uh, I know Kevin just had a book come out also oh, he did. Uh, on bait on bait fish patterns for steelhead. Yep, cool. it, it it literally just hit the shelves like last week. Who who are so you so, mentioned uh, Rick uh, uh, Kustich, uh, Jeff L- Liske, Kevin uh, Feenstra, John Nagy. I mean. Those are probably when I think of uh, you know names. Those are huge, and, and as well as yourself. I mean, these are five names that always come up when you think of Great Lakes. Are, are there, is there anybody else? Um, you know, is there a bunch of other people that should be on that list, or are you guys kind of the? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's there's certainly you know guys that are that are on the water a ton. Uh, yeah. You know that these days that that fish a lot now. You know, uh, out of the out of the Ohio area, you know. Uh, John Fabian is a is a is a great guide. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a, a Senio's old old company, Steelhead Alley Outfitters, is, is a great group of guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh gosh, I mean, yeah, there's, there's plenty. Uh, plenty, I'm, plenty I know I'm going to forget somebody. Yeah, no, we don't want to nail. Off, but, yeah, exactly. I don't want yeah. to nail you down for that. <laughs> you know, That's good. But, uh, you know, but there's there's tons of resources out there. There there's you know, great guides, uh, you know, there's a shop in Cleveland here, Chagrin River Outfitters that has, you know, some good guys that work out of it. Uh, you know, so yeah, there is, you know, there's a lot going on here, but you know, from, you know, Jeff is certainly probably the, the most well-known out of the Lake Erie guys. Yeah. Uh, and you know, oh, well, I mean, that's who I got my start from. Oh, in cool. Steelhead fishing. Oh, cool. You know, so, so Jeff kind of got me going in it. So I there would say if there's there's a, the best all-around resource in this area, that's probably who it would be. It's Jeff, yeah. Okay, good. 
Okay, well, yep. I think, yeah, that's, no, that's perfect. I mean, obviously, there, there's a bunch of other uh, things we could have dove into here, but I, I love that we dug into a little bit on the history, and, and uh, it sounds like your your current book that's just come out has uh, some of that history, so I can, I'll can i put links to the show notes to, to your books and everything we talked about here. Um, anything in the next uh, 6 to 12 months, anything else you got come that's new other than your book that you want to give a highlight here? Uh, you know, I got a couple things going out. Uh, I think I'll have some stuff in this next edition of Fly Tire Magazine. Oh, nice. Uh, the winter edition, I've got some stuff coming in. And then uh, American Fly Fishing, there is a western end of Lake Erie piece coming out. Uh, so those are those should be out, you know, any time. Uh, and a few other things in the works right yeah. now, but uh, not, you know, not at completion at this point gotcha. yet. Okay. And and also on the on the reps we didn't go dig into it. I mean, how many companies do you rep just just a general? Do you have are you, is there a, just a bunch or just a few? Well, I am I'm out of the rep game. Oh, so oh, I, you are. Yeah. So I sold my I sold that business uh first of the year uh uh-huh. to a, a fellow by the name of Phil Cook who worked at Scientific Anglers. So uh-huh. uh 30 years on the road was kind of enough. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is uh, uh, I'm doing some marketing support work for scientific anglers. Um, um, you know, I'm on the Scott Pro staff. I'm kind of ramped up the writing stuff a little bit and uh, just kind of taking it easy a little bit, too. Yeah, so, that's right. uh, you know, I had a bunch of trips planned for this year, this summer and everything that, that got scrubbed because uh, of the whole COVID thing. Uh-huh. So. I'm hoping I can get those uh, get those in next year. Yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome. It sounds like you're kind of in the like getting towards more of like a retirement phase. Is that is that kind of where is yeah. that where you're headed? Yeah, quasi quasi retirement. Yeah. But not quite. But not quite. What's the and I, and I think a lot of people that I talk to, it's like nobody ever quite retires that are you know have a, <laughs> a history like yourself. Right. I mean, with th- thirty years on the road, I mean uh, the repping thing. What is the you know what is the best thing? What what's the most memorable? What th- what do you love about doing that for thirty years? Uh, just uh, being able to meet and actually help and educate people. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think. I mean, that was. I think I really in, enjoyed that a lot. And you know, and I I did a lot of guiding in that time period too. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, kind of seasonally guiding, uh, especially here. Uh, on the trips here, yeah, uh, you know, and just you know, kind of seeing that guy get his first fish, first steelhead, no matter what technique, or then again getting it first one on a swing or something like that. But even just being able to help people out, help help them select equipment. Uh, the other aspect is you know being involved with some of these top tier companies and you know having input on product and and development and helping in development uh i had was really you know i really enjoyed that that's awesome that's awesome and just and then just the whole networking throughout the whole industry and everything you know so uh a lot of cool people that's the reason yeah i mean i think that's the reason we're talking here it's uh, your name has definitely been out there for a while and it's, it's good to hear I, I love connecting the history pieces, and that's, you know, here we've done that a little bit. So um, so I guess, yeah, if anybody has questions for you, I think it sounds like on Instagram. Is it just Jerry Darkus on Instagram? Yep, that's it. Okay, perfect. I'll put a link to that, Jerry. Hey, thanks for coming on and taking the time. I know you got to run uh, to pick up your wife there, so I appreciate you hanging here and uh, and taking us out of here and, and all the work you've done over the years. It's definitely, um, you know, it's a great resource, and I appreciate uh, everything you've done. Okay, well, Dave, I, I'm, yeah, I appreciate you getting a hold of me and having me on, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, maybe one of these days we'll bump into each other somewhere. So Yeah, I'm planning, I'm planning on it. I'm planning on coming out there, so hopefully I'll, I'll see you out, the, out, out uh, in your neck of the woods. Okay, take care. Thanks. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes and all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 170. I would love if you could uh, take a minute and leave a quick rating and review for this show. Uh, if you go to wetflyswing.com slash love, love will get you there. Love is the answer. Um, got a, There's a page there that will redirect uh, to your app of choice, and uh, it would be great. I'm not sure on Apple. We've got a number of reviews, but I'm not sure which app you use. 
Uh, if you want to give me a heads up, uh, send a DM over on uh, Twitter. That's Wet Fly Swing on Twitter, and let me know uh, what app you're listening on. That would be cool. I can track down um, which episode uh, you're loving and you're listening to, and I can connect with you a little bit further there. Thanks again today for stopping by the show. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.